Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining our uh, first clubhouse room on data dignity, where we talk about dealing you into the data economy. I'm Julie Schmidt, and I am host for this room, which will soon be a club. Um, as we get started, for those of you that are already here, um, especially those with party hats, a uh, couple of pointers. You can use the little plus sign at the bottom. Uh, to ping others into the room that you think may be interested in the conversation. Uh, you can use the search bar in there if you have a lot of followers um, to narrow it down to specific people by name or by topic or a keyword that might be in their bio. It'll, it'll help bring those people to the front so you don't have to sift through everyone. Um, and as we go along, be sure to check out and follow others in the room. We're inspired. You can um, follow new people with the little party symbol uh, to support them and uh, be sure to follow uh, myself and um, our other moderators, panelists, and all the co-hosts here. Uh, also, we definitely encourage you to raise your digital hand. Uh, we'll certainly do our best to get to everybody's questions, but we definitely encourage uh, the participation. Um, for those that don't yet know, Consuli, um, Bradley Consuli is a public benefit company with the mission to enable individuals to participate in the data economy. So experts are suggesting our individual data is worth 20K per year. Um, that's very important. So we're doing this by operating a marketplace for members where we become their agent and assemble patients. Health records, labs, prescriptions, wearables, quality of life surveys, things of that nature. Um, and importantly, members receive smart matched individualized offers from us for opportunities um, you know, including to participate in clinical trials or data trials, things of that nature. Um, there is no cost for anyone to join our movement, and you can learn more about us at consuli.net. That's C-O-N-S-U-L-I.net. And it's now my pleasure to turn the floor over to our room moderator, Elizabeth Dreiser, who is a philanthropist, activist, and co-founder and CEO of Consuli. Uh, Elizabeth will be introducing our distinguished panelists and guests. Elizabeth, over to you. Oh, thanks, Julie, and thanks for all your help making this event possible. Um, welcome, everyone. We're honored to be able to host and facilitate for this discussion. Um, first, I'd like to introduce our panelists and co-host, Terrence Craig. Terrence is the Chief Investment Officer for the Impact Seat, one of the leading independent investor and high-growth technology companies led by women, especially women of color. At the Impact Seat, Terrence leads investment activities and provides post-investment support for over 60 portfolio companies, which means he must be very busy. Uh, he also monitors their LP investment in several venture funds. Uh, as an experienced technologist, speaker, and author, Terrence has founded multiple companies and has served as the CTO at multiple venture-backed companies, including the Mayfield funded consensus software and several pioneering enterprise and big data software companies. Terrence was one of the earliest black CEOs and founders to raise VC way back in 1998. And he uses that experience and expertise to improve the startup ecosystem. His goal has been to support other non-traditional founders in navigating the startup landscape and his efforts to increase inclusion in the startup ecosystem led Terrence to join the executive team at Astia Angels, which is an international angel group focused on investing in high growth companies with women on the leadership team. During his time at Astia, Terrence ran a pilot investment program for support, to support women of color called the Representation Program, funded by strategic corporate funders. 
The program was such a success that Astia now has made it a permanent part of their investment platform. Uh, and Terrence has a book, a book called Privacy and Big Data. He, it's been translated into several languages and is currently available to purchase in all the, the normal uh, platforms such as Amazon, etc. So join me in welcoming uh, Terrence. Um, next up, Ethan Pierce. Uh, thanks again, Ethan, for joining us. Uh, Ethan is an American living in France. As an entrepreneur, he has built companies in the U.S., France, and Singapore, and is currently founder at Borderless Ventures, where he helps startups scale between Europe, Southeast Asia, and the U.S., as well as director of the Crypto Assets Institute, advising governments, corporates, and investment funds on issues related to the blockchain economy and crypto assets. In 2019, he gave 65 keynote speeches at conferences in 26 countries, and in 2020, he spoke at even more digital events, uh, now uh, from the comfort of his home in Paris, and speaks at or moderates 5 to 10 events per week, as well as several innovation-focused podcasts. His blockchain economy newsletter and podcast is a top five podcast in the non-crypto blockchain space and also hosts French tech news and English language media highlighting news in the French tech startup ecosystem. Amon, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And it over to Terence briefly to, to introduce and share some perspectives on this topic, data dignity, dealing us up to the data economy. Terrence, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Elizabeth, and thank you for the uh, kind introduction. Um, I, I feel I feel better than uh, before you started uh, after that. So <laughs> my experience with privacy was driven by privacy and the um, sort of digital dignity. It's completely driven by my experience as a technologist and realizing, what, about a decade ago, just how pervasive um, our digital trails have become and how, in fact, one of the things that I said when I wrote the book is, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. And really, this is about changing the dynamic and really letting people control their own data, um, control the use of their data, and to protect themselves both from commercial interests that aren't doing ethical things with data, um, invading privacy, selling people's data without their permission, as well as governments who, who may be beneficial actors now, but we're building infrastructure that is completely destructive in the wrong hands. And here in the States, we had a rogue administration, I'm, hopefully I'm not offending anybody, but we had a rogue administration who had some of the deadliest information gathering assets that have ever been created. And got to get a handle on this and people have to be able to own their data and have some control to have any sort of currency in the in this digital economy that we're creating. Thanks so much Terrence for opening that up. Ethan, love to hear your opening thoughts as well. It's definitely a, a fascinating discussion that we're seeing now with you know, even applications like Clubhouse where the growth of the application is, is predicated on us sharing our, our contacts and our open graphs so that they can then reach out to that and continue to build this. In the case of Clubhouse, this referral based invite system and, and kind of a walled garden approach to create, uh, obviously, to help the company while they scale to keep things um, uh, moving as far as infrastructure, but also to create kind of the FOMO of being a part of something special. And so I think as we move forward, we're going to see more and more uh, ways that technology is going to enable us to at least control the access to our data on a more granular level and be able to pull back that access, but also potentially to monetize it when we have platforms like this that are themselves leveraging our uh, data and our graph in order to be able to scale um, their application. And so obviously in the, in the case of early stage startups, it, there's got to be some kind of trade-off there where there's not necessarily monetization that's capable of what, what I think is at least important in a situation like the clubhouse is the ability to be able to pull back our data. And so right now we have no visibility on, you know, if you shared your contact, uh, access to your contacts when you uh, installed the application, when you, if you 
about in Twitter and Instagram that then now we, we don't have visibility on how that data is has been stored and how it's being treated and used for it. I think in many of these cases, it's completely not a problem and, and, and it's not something that we have to be fearful of, but the problem is that we don't know. And so I think that uh, as we move forward, we're going to see a lot of technology that's going to provide ways to control that. And I think um, while, while blockchain is often thrown around as a solution to all kinds of things that it's not actually a solution for, um, one of the best ways that um, it could potentially be used is the ability to create an access system to our personal information, um, whether it's digital IDs and then, and then tying into our data, the ability for access control so that instead of giving our data to a platform like Clubhouse, and I'm very pro Clubhouse, but, but in the sense of if, if I give them access to my contacts, I need to be able to pull that access back and actually have the information um, still, you know, that it's it's not gone on and wandered around and being stored somewhere else, somewhere else. So there are many ways using digital ledgers to be able to provide access to data without actually providing the data itself, which then allows a company on the other side to leverage the data, but you as the person to be able to control the access and at any time that you were to pull that access back, the data has, has now been cut off. So I think it's a brilliant topic. Um, I think we're going to see lots of interesting things as we move forward. And, uh, if nothing else, just a more granular way that we can deal with how our information is being shared and how we can pull it back. But I also think we're going to see a lot more opportunities to monetize that. Um, and I think that'll be very interesting. Thanks, Ethan, for those opening comments. Um, would love to dig in to one of the thorny issues, which you know we we hear a lot about. You know the new regs that are protecting us, uh, and yet um, the efficacy of the consent process. Um, perhaps folks want to opine on on what you think the. Um, true efficacy is of, of the consenting mechanisms that currently exist. Terrence, do you want to kick us off? Sure. The I think one of the things, one of the things that was most surprising to me when we were doing research for the book back in 2011 <clears throat> was the secondary data market and how you could sign up for a site and not necessarily know what data they would collect, particularly Facebook famously tracking your movement across the internet is a great example. And as an aside, I, I want to say kudos to Apple for raising this to the public consciousness because I think people are finally understanding how what a complete picture um, that commercial interests have. But part of the problem of opt-in consent is you consent to one vendor or one website and that data gets sold to various entities and you have absolutely no visibility to it. And in fact, the US government rather famously has some restrictions on data they can collect on US citizens. They have no restrictions on buying that data for commercial interest. And so I think to be useful, opt-in and opt-out has to really deal with the transfer of data to third parties. Um, what happens to your data if an acquisition happens or a merger happens? Only then can we really start to get to individuals controlling their data when we control the marketplace and the data. Thanks, Terrence. Uh, Ethan, do you want to weigh in here? Well, I think the problem that the, 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 the systems that we have for consent are we have systems to give consent, but we don't actually have a system to give it back because while we can tell people, um, like under the GDPR, things that we want um, to have our data uh, deleted and, and, and whatever, we have no way to prove that because the consent is not, a, it's not an actual mechanism that's, that's providing a, a technological access to the data, it's just legal consent. So, so there is no technological mechanism in, in the case of most websites or um, applications that's actually controlling the access to that data so that you and revoke the access. So I think that that's really the issue. I think that we have um, strong privacy protections now in place, but we don't actually have technological solutions that can enforce those so that we actually know that our data has not been copied, that it's not, um, that it's not actually in the, the possession of an application or web, that they, uh, they simply have uh, 
access to our data in order to be able to use it for the needs that they have to do as a school. So I think that from the legal perspective, I, as, as, a, as a French uh, resident and somebody under the GDPR, um, with all of my, my daily life in terms of whether it's my banking or my general web surfing or whatever that might be, I think uh, that we have very strong controls and penalties in place for access and, and, and usage of this data. We don't actually have any technological solutions that really can uh, enforce that without it becoming a legal issue. Um, you know, that, that really what that provides. It doesn't provide a technological stack. And so I think that's you know, that's that's the real thing to be done. I think in, in Europe we are protected well um, legally. We're just not protected technologically. Yeah, I think one of the I think one of the problems is given the inherent complexity of these global um, social media platforms in particular. It's not clear that the vendors can actually find your data and delete it across entirely across their platforms because these systems have become so complex and they've evolved so quickly and it, it's just a very difficult issue. So the, the technology is not there to implement the, the legal the legal requirements. And that I think that's going to continue to be an issue for the major platforms. Yeah, interesting points here. And I'm curious, Ethan, whether you think the blockchain technology, sort of setting aside the crypto piece, right, but just the blockchain technology, do you feel that this is an eclipse issue, that it isn't, is, um, wasn't designed with this sort of give and take, uh, turning on and off, and also this secondary and sort of third party market? I'd, I'd be curious, you know, given I know you're in that scene, um, what you think in terms of, you know, a lot of people seem to be using the rhetoric that blockchain sort of is going to solve it all. Uh, I'm curious what you say to Terrence's point here that you know, that system, the systems have yet been built. So I'm curious about that. Yeah, well, I don't think that, I, I think we're probably saying the same thing in many ways. I think that the systems in order to, to manage data, to access leveraging digital methods like sort of blockchains are, are still pretty young. They haven't Yet. And I think that there are people working in that space. Part of the issue is, is you also need a digital ID. Um, and so we need to have some kind of standardized ID that allows those systems to work well. And so I think that's, until we see that happen, it's going to be harder to have standardized systems of access control to the data. I think the thing that digital ledgers and blockchain bring to this discussion that's so interesting is, is um, as you mentioned before, there's, we have no way to know if um, um, the data has been deleted on all these different systems, if there's copies of it out there, you know, if, if a startup puts their data on AWS and it's being pushed to, um, you know, in terms of it's being rendered um, redundant across um, um, multiple, multiple, multiple servers, which is the whole point of, of the cloud computing aspect for them, uh, how, how do we really know that that data has been deleted if we ask for it to be Back. Well, the whole point of using ledgers or, or blockchain in that situation is, is that they never got the data in the first place. You have your data and it's stored wherever that data is stored in, in, in the platform that we will be talking about having in place. What you provide is access controls, kind of like an API, so that whenever Clubhouse needs to know my age, needs to know my email address, needs to know my Twitter handle, needs to know my contacts, it asks that repository for the information, and it only gets access to the information if the keys that have been established by this uh, blockchain-enabled system uh, are current. And if I have canceled those keys, then all of a sudden it's going to get a no. And if it gets that no, it doesn't have the data. If it gets a yes, it has the data and can use the data, but it doesn't store the data. It's simply using it, and it, if there's a storage mechanism there that needs to happen, it's a temporary storage mechanism instead of more of a they need to have a copy of this data in order to continue to leverage it. That's not going to be practical in all situations, but it, it, it is actually fairly practical in a lot of the usages where we're giving access to um, platforms or tools in order to use those. Uh, in the same way that if we sign into a, a web app with, with our, our uh, Gmail or our Twitter or, or whatever, and we're using OAuth to access that, if you cancel the OAuth um, to that application, they no longer can tie back to that. Now, if they copied any of the information in the process, then that would be potentially, uh, what did the terms of service say about how that was used? Was that something that was allowed or not allowed? But having an access control that you can pull back is what we're talking about here. And hopefully, 
in that system. The data is not being copied. The whole point is that it is uh, you're providing access for the usage of that data, which solves the problem of having all of these duplicate copies of our data roaming around all over the place. Um, but that's the data. The thing we have to take into account is even if we build these systems, we still have a metadata discussion to discuss, which is yeah. more scary because even if we have our data that is secured, um, we can still do things with the metadata. Yeah. Well, yeah. Go ahead, Terrence. And then I'd like to follow up with Ethan on this question. One of the concerns that I've heard about the centralization of data and permission access is once you have a centralized data repository, it becomes very simple for state agencies to access it and get a more comprehensive picture than they've had before. And so I've, I've talked to people who have real concerns about the centralization of our data because it's incredibly inconvenient to collect all of those, all of the various data sources about one individual now. Um, this would, this mediation would help on the commercial side, but what about the people that are concerned uh, about state actors? I, I think it's a great point. I think um, for me, the entire discussion around um, data privacy around um, all of the issues that we want to have in terms of controlling who has access to data or not is completely commercial discussion between us and the services that we want to use. Um, to, to not speak too harshly, but to use the language that I would, I would say applies, anybody who thinks that the government does not and will not always have access to whatever data they want is completely naive and an idiot. Yeah. Um, there are no solutions that are going to protect that. The, and for me, the data privacy aspect is not about because I don't think that we can control or, or stop that in any way, especially with the metadata discussion. Yep. For me, what will be important is, is if I want to give access to my address book to Clubhouse so it can find the people who go on Clubhouse, I need to be able to pull back that access and know that they never actually had my address book. They only had a token to access my address book when they needed to, which is not the case today. And again, I'm not picking on Clubhouse. This is mm -hmm. the case with every platform. But that is what interests me, is the commercial goal of my data and potentially the monetization of it because of the fact that as a tech entrepreneur and as an investor, I am very aware of what it takes to build an app like this or a platform and the need to start somewhere without necessarily having the capital to buy all of that. But sooner or later, um, you're making an awful lot of money uh, and the people that you're leveraging their information are getting none of that value. From it. I think there needs to be a happy place in between that first version and the second version where potentially in the future we could monetize in some way our, our data uh, and, and be able to, to, to see a benefit from that. But in the first most important idea, we just need to be able to pull back access to that information. But for me, that has nothing to do with the government because it is just unrealistic to think that um, on the metadata level alone, but I think on the general data as well, that we're ever going to stop state actors from having a complete view of our life and everything in it. Yep. Uh, if, if you like that, then go buy a Nokia and a brick phone and, and, and live in the basement because that's the only way. But the moment you want to have maps on your phone, you want to use an uh, email system, the moment you want to do pretty much anything, apply for a job, whatever, you just, you're, you're giving the information away. You can't expect uh, state actors to not profile that in some way. Um, but under the GDPR, for example, there are ways to control that, but yeah, it only goes to me. Yeah, I appreciate this. And just for our audience members, we're going to kind of air out the key big themes and then we'll be um, taking questions. So please feel free to start raising your digital hand and Julie will bring you up on the stage as we move forward. Um, I want to throw out another thorny topic while we're on on the, uh, you know, we're, we're going to first air out all the problems, then we're going to see if we can find any solutions or recommendations out of all of this. We've already started to hear from you guys about some suggestions, and I think that's fantastic, you know, as we think about making this productive. Um, a thorny item, though, is de-identified data. You know, supposedly that's, you know, everything's cool if it's de-identified. Who wants to dig into that uh, issue? Well, the, I'll, I'll take the first stab at it. Okay. I, um, one of the things, you have this real push and pull. The more data, for example, that is available for individual health outcomes, the better research you can do. And they're, they're starting now, we're starting to see mathematical techniques of privacy comes to mind. 
um, that allows the data to keep its characteristics and aggregate, but it hides the individual characteristics of the data, so it's almost impossible to sort of reverse engineer where this data came from. Um, so I do think there are technology solutions that will allow us to hide individual data and still get the benefit of the aggregate statistics and analytics. Um, and so that's my take. Interesting. You raised the issue, um, Terrence, on hiding where the data comes from. I wonder, you know, not to pile on here, but I wonder what that means in terms of you know, sort of accountability or attribution of bad actors, right? So do they end up, you know, essentially skirting the regs? So it, it feels like an arms race, does it not? Yes, um, and also there's, there's even bigger concerns. So we use data sets and analytics to set social policy. Um, once you get into manipulating the data so that you can't identify the source, can you really trust it? But right. we'll still make emergency decisions based on it. Um, so there's there's a ton of issues uh, to be dealt with. Yeah, I think lots lots here. Uh, Ethan, do you want to take on the de-identified data? And I know we audience members who will have something yeah. to say about this as well, and and anything else that that inspired. I think for me the issue is 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 in calling something de-identified data is potentially a misnomer depending on the data we're talking about because we're talking about smaller sets of data than we can maybe personal identifying you know, information that we're coming. But the, the larger the data set or the more detailed the data set gets, the more that whether humans can, can understand that there are connecting points. Um, if we're talking about big data and machine learning and, and AI and uh, analysis of that, we're, it's going to be just because just you take my name off of it doesn't mean um, it's not going to know exactly who I am from all the data points. Um, you know, again, back to the, the metadata idea of, of um, just being able to know that, you know, if uh, you can cut all the personally identifiable information out of my daily, whatever I might be doing here in Paris, if we had a daily life outside right now, right now but if we did, uh, and we had the coffee shop down the street that I go to and maybe I happen to go to the post office one day a week and I happen to go to the bank another day during the week and I happen to uh, always like lunch in a certain place uh, or, or at least once every two weeks at the same place. You can remove the personal identity information from that information or transaction data or whatever but at a certain point the data itself still draws a map and so I think that, that on a personal identifiable side of it we have to be Aware that the larger and more detailed the data set is, the the the, le the less that the concept of de-identified data is even. Because the whole point is is, is that the, those data points are growing future, and that picture can get pretty precise, pretty quick, based on our personal decisions and, and what it's referring. You know, if we're talking about medical data, for example, if it's if, if you were to take. Um, you know, we in the other groups where we've talked about the long COVID thing and stuff like that, if you were to take a, a picture of my medical records um, and take out my personal identifiable information, it still draws a really clear picture that we're talking about. Ethan, if you have any ability to have a database next to it that, that allows any of my personal identifiable information to, to one of those data points, because, because there's only going to be one person who is having that exact set of, of those particular different um, uh, medical issues taking those particular treatments from those particular healthcare professionals. And once you add in the fact that my doctors are different from your doctors and we have slightly different problems and we're getting slightly different treatments, that draws a very clear picture. And so if you have access to that data, it's kind of the thing we talk about with, with cryptocurrencies about people thinking that they are anonymous in terms of like Bitcoin, for example, um, in transactions. While it is true, that if I create a, a wallet using a, um, uh, a non-exchange in the wallet uh, system, whether it's you know, a hardware wallet or, or a software wallet, that at that moment doesn't know who I am. All it is is a hardware. Is, all it is is an address to receive some Bitcoin or Ether. Um, and I receive it from somebody, and then I send it to somebody else. And we do all kinds of bad things with that or good things with that. It doesn't really matter. Right now, completely anonymous in that scenario. But the moment that I decide to put that on an exchange or pull some of that through the exchange in one of my bank
bank accounts or maybe go on to Expedia and buy myself a plane ticket or an Airbnb or go to Overstock and buy myself something um, or, or you know, buy that Tesla with my Bitcoin or, or whatever the, the ways are that you are now taking that crypto out of the system. The point is, is if 99% of the data was is, is anonymous, that's great. But the moment that you have a data point in there somewhere that points out who you are, the whole system is you're able to backtrack and figure it out. And there are startups that, that that's what they sell. There's, there's software solutions to the government and others now with where you know the IRS can, can can look at a wallet address and know everything about everybody connected to that, even though it's technically anonymous, simply because you were doing non-anonymous transactions somewhere in the system. And that makes all the other transactions no longer anonymous. So I think this idea of de-identified data is potentially uh, troublesome um, mm -hmm. depending on the actual data sets we're discussing. Yeah, interesting. Uh, thank you so much, gentlemen. And I see, Julie, that we've got some folks who have some questions. Do you want to identify who's up? Oops. Oops. Except for you're on mute. <laughs> yes, Julie. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. And I accidentally just, uh, sorry. Uh, I'm going to you, you invite can, uh, You can Janice. pull back up. I think you're trying to get Janice. Yeah, yeah there you are. Uh, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you are. Oh. Yeah, hi, hello, uh, very interesting discussion. My name is Yanis, uh, and I run a multinational organization that looks at the, um, um, at the ways how to uh, counter hostile influence operations and uh, also look at the uh, emerging vulnerabilities. And as such, uh, one part of our work has been looking at the data as a vulnerability, so I thought I might add a different perspective, but in fact I think uh, quite similar and probably a number of added uh, considerations. And first, to me, what we increasingly see is uh, how uh, valuable the data is, not only for, uh, for business, but also for uh, being the the basis for um, actually influ influencing uh, people's decisions. We actually once uh, run an experiment after the uh, the Cambridge Analytica to test the uh, the, uh, uh, the claim, and uh, we've tried within a military exercise, like our own military exercise, uh, whether based on big data we can uh, actually uh, influence soldiers' behavior in a in a field. And the results came back pretty uh, shocking in a way that we were able to uh, influence soldiers to disobey orders, and et cetera, et cetera. Of course, uh, um, it was uh, a, s a special area, and et cetera. But to me, the data is not only about the, uh, the, the finance and the business, but it is also about influence. And if you think about the governments, I, for myself, I can tell from the governments that I work for, mostly European governments, what they really are worried is the way this uh, data-based, uh, uh, micro-targeted political uh, messaging and what kind of uh, effect it creates on the democratic processes. So uh, from the, the place I sit, it's not only about individuals, it's not only about businesses, but it's also about the ability to influence uh, influence human behaviors to a very substantive level. And also it's about the way it is affecting the, uh, the political discourse and eventually the, the, the democracy as such. And of course, not to mention the fact that uh, there are many different governments looking uh, not only your own government, but many other different governments looking for the data and use, try, trying to use that for the leverage for different, mostly hostile uh, purposes. So, what I, what I wanted to probably add as a question, as um, I have a kind of regular discussions with the, uh, uh, both the uh, uh, parliamentarians, uh, the European side, EU, as well as at the at the US side, what would be your recommendation besides, uh, you know, GDPR, which is, my, in my view, is not that effective, 
uh, what would you recommend these people? Uh, what would be the considerations for the past if they should uh, look at? It? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yanis, great question, and thank you so much for the contribution and also thinking about the broader impact, which we are all seeing all over the world. Certainly, uh, the U.S. Has, has been a target of much of this negative influence uh, campaigning. Terrence, I'm wondering if you have a point of view here on, you know, what is the solution? Well, I think the, I think, I think the long-term solution is that we have to require vendors that are collecting data to do privacy by design to really, you know, I, one of the things I like about the European model in general is this idea of you have to justify keeping data. Um, and I think if we can put real teeth into that, the next generation of technology or the next iteration of current technology, we can do a lot to solve sort of this data leakage problem. Um, as Ethan said, we're not going to be, the part of the problem is we're not going to be able to, to change state actors' ability to gather information and to weaponize it. But we can cer certainly take that ability away from commercial organizations with technical requirements. But then you run into the problem is that it is incredibly difficult for legislative processes to keep up with technical, technical processes because we run so quickly that legislation is almost always behind the capabilities that are common in the technical sector. And that, I don't have a solution for. Thanks, Terrence. Um, anybody else? Ethan, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, I think, well, again, it's, um, are we talking about a legislative or, or legal solution, or are we talking about technological solutions? And so I think that... Both, I think. Um, you know, I, we have to... There are both that need to be in place, but the, the problem with the legislative side of things, um, like Janice mentioned with the GDPR, is you know, things have to have teeth, and they have to be, they actually have to be applied. There has to be penalties, and so you know, and also that's that's also kind of the idea of you know the good actors are going to follow the rules, but the bad actors could potentially you know, what happens if these organizations are hacked, or what happens if um, um, whatever that happens, you know, maybe an organization is great, but they have a bad, they have an employee that, that decides to do something. Whatever. So, so the, the legislative side of this is simply there to, to make sure that, that people have lines that they're supposed to stay in, um, but it doesn't actually make them stay in them, or even if it does on the, on the macro level in terms of the organizational level, it still doesn't prevent you know, bad things from happening. So we need privacy by design, like Terrence mentioned, we need technological advances. And so I guess to, to kind of circle back to what I said, that you're not going to be able to keep state actors from what's going on. It's not exactly true. I think, you know, I, I mean, I'm the one who said it, but what I would mean is, is that um, it is true now, but if we were doing, um, um, if we had decentralized currencies and decentralized financial instruments around like the, the DeFi idea with uh, all the different aspects of getting, getting loans and insurance and um, dealing with different kinds of assets and, and Investments and dealing with those in a way where we didn't have all these civilized actors and all of them that were really necessary. Uh, if we had things where, um, for example, we see companies like Apple that, that are protecting um, uh, or trying to protect our privacy more in the app store by showing us what, what apps have, that, what kind of access they have to our information, um, by not providing access to devices and, and opening things up when governments ask them to. You know, when we see the technology providers also creating um, processes and or technology that blocks that, then I think we actually get to a point where maybe um, it's it's even harder for these organizations to, when we're not talking about actually giving access to our data, we're talking about the fact that, that when, our, when we aren't giving access, that it's very hard to get access to the data without permission, but also on the metadata discussion or other things, there's less information there to get. So if everybody was spending digital currencies that we're, more private, not necessarily Bitcoin, but, but things that can actually have a, a more of an anonymous side to them or more private, if they were using um, VPNs that have a randomization aspect to them that make it much more harder to understand what you're doing whenever you serve, if they were, if your financial uh, activities were going through DeFi solutions and not necessarily centralized financial solutions, um, blah, blah, blah. I think if we had all these different things kind of in place, then we would see a different place. Um, 
I think technology is going to evolve with privacy by design ideas where um, people are going to get to a point where they have a, they have a choice between things that respect the privacy or not. The, the, the last example here uh, was uh, there was a French startup that was bought by Sonos last year, but it's, and it was for um, voice recognition uh, in devices. And so what, what they had built was, you know, if you wanted to tell your TV or your coffee maker or whatever, you know, to, to run or if you want to be able to ask you questions or, or anything like you do with Siri or, or, or Google or Alexa, um, the typical model of that obviously is you have to take that, that small audio piece, send it to the cloud to have it analyzed, and it's the appropriate uh, analysis and instructions to the device. SNPs created um, an AI-powered, an, an embedded AI-powered solution where that technology for the exact things that you could ask. So obviously you couldn't ask your coffee maker what the weather was um, unless it, it knew that question, but you could tell it what to, to, to turn on and when to turn on, things like that. And it would never have to send that information to the cloud or, or outside of the system because the AI to understand that those voice snippets was embedded on the chip that was built into the device. So that kind of privacy by design creates a scenario where as a manufacturer, you can be Samsung, for example, and say our TVs don't actually, whenever you tell the TV to raise the volume or change the channel, none of that information ever actually goes out to the web because it's all being done on chip um, on the system. And as those chips get more powerful and as those things are in place, this gets pretty interesting. Um, and so we get privacy by design solutions that create a scenario where people have choice between privacy by design or not privacy by design. That takes us to a future where we have legislative choices that give teeth and, and give guidelines for organizations to follow, but then we have some technological solutions which create a scenario where our data and potentially metadata are no longer shared or are identifiable. Um, we're not there yet, but we're moving forward. Uh, I just wanted to echo that. There, we just actually funded a company that's doing AI, so-called AI on the edge. Um, they have a dedicated screen device that captures sentiment and images of people walking by to sell them stuff. Um, the company's called Visual. But the all of that processing is done on screen and no information is other than demographics, basic demographics is ever sent back to the central server. Um, I think you'll see a lot more solutions like that. Um, and hardware on the edge is probably the best way that we can start to deliver services without really destroying individual privacy. So I think it's a very interesting trend. Thanks, Terrence. Yeah, very interesting. And just thinking back to Giannis's comment and, and also the comments about inability to really rein in state actors, it occurs to me that, uh, that many of the issues that we're dealing with that are essentially threatening you know, human democratic democratic processes are actually the weaponization of the commercial assets. You know, it's the it's the Facebooks and the feeds of information. So I'm just curious um, as we think about the solutions for the, especially the you know adherence to policy, which you know let's assume that the seriously bad actors that are sort of underground are probably not going to be compliant, but our public companies that have sort of aggregation power are going to be uh, more compliant, right? Um, you know, if for no other reason than they've got a lot of eyes on them. Uh, just curious if, you know, if anybody has a thought related to that thread. Giannis, if you're speaking, you're on mute, or Terrence, please feel free to jump in. The, I, I, well, I think there's a fundamental problem that the major players, um, specifically Google and Facebook, um, leap to mind, have a business model that literally requires them to destroy privacy. And the, I think that Ethan is right. Um, consumers are going to start making choices. And there's going to be alternatives. There already are privacy, more privacy friendly alternatives that Google available. They're not nearly as convenient or universal, but I do think I think we're a couple of major data breaches away from consumers actively starting to consider their privacy and their ability to not be manipulated by weaponized data is going to become more important to them. Until that happens, yeah, could I uh, add something to this? 
Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Um, Terrence, do you want to just finish your thoughts? Yeah, quickly? Until, until that happens, I don't think we're going to make any major inroads. I'm very interested in what Apple is doing because Apple is literally going straight at Facebook's business model. And it's, it's going to become clear over the next year or so how much do consumers across the world really value their privacy. It's not clear to me that they do, but we're going to find out. Interesting. Thank you so much. Um, John, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I could. Um, Please. So, uh, love your last comment, Terrence. Um, there's an old saying that, uh, that privacy ends where convenience begins. And so the Facebook model and all of the major social networks, um, Clubhouse remains to be seen, uh, how they'll monetize all the data they have. Um, but they operate on a model of you are the product, as someone said earlier. If you're not paying for it, you are the product. And so I just, it, it, it has shocked me um, to this day why we don't have an alternative to Facebook where I suspect most people on this call would be willing to pay 10 bucks a month um, to have the kind of access and services you get from Facebook with the assurance that they wouldn't monetize, retain, or sell our data in any way, shape, or form. So um, I, I think that there is a huge business opportunity for somebody to execute well on um, in the social media space. And I love what Apple's doing. It's pretty clear from the beginning that Tim Cook was cut from the privacy cloth and that he's going to build Apple's brand. And I believe uh, that Apple has an incredibly bright future as a refuge for uh, the abuse of uh, privacy that, that is the business model of uh, all of the free services that we get globally. So we're, we're probably going to end up seeing sort of a bimodal uh, set of services, one of which is we give you our services free, but we sell your data at will. Um, and then the other one is you pay for a subscription um, and you um, have to risk that. So I just wanted to return to one of the earlier issues around de-identification. And I'm a firm believer that de-identification is a myth of the beast. Um, I've written two book chapters on the topic and I posted them on my profile if anybody wants to read. Um, my thoughts about all the mechanisms potentially for uh, overcoming the fatal flaws and the notion of de-identification. I gave a talk at the National Academies of Science and Medicine two years ago about the use of distributed ledger technology and homomorphic encryption as an alternative. Uh, homomorphic encryption allows you to uh, aggregate data, allow access to it without the ability to identify any within that data set. Um, the only problem is it requires a common data model as input, and um, it has high computational overhead, but in uh, Microsoft and others are working on reducing the uh, computational overhead of homomorphic encryption. There are other alternatives in multi-party security protocol, encryption protocols. Um, and then the last thing I just want to mention um, is uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the privacy by design uh, construct and concept, Ann Kabukian, uh, an amazing Canadian woman, um, have built the model of privacy by design, and it's it's worth a read if you haven't read uh, about her and, and her principled work on privacy by design. So there's, there, as, as Elizabeth said earlier, we need both policy and technology. The technology is there, but it's not really easily implementable at this moment, um, but I think it will be fairly soon, and I think Apple is, is going to set the bar uh, for how to do this kind of uh, allowing service without uh, extorting your data, per se. And, and of course, uh, Consuli that Elizabeth is working on has its own model um, of doing that as well. So um, kudos to Elizabeth and team. Down that path. Thanks so much, John. 
uh, we obviously recognize there's huge uh, issues in this uh, minefield, if you will. I'm interested in opening up the dialogue since it's emerged, and John, you raised it as well, as well as others, uh, about just sort of social justice as it relates to these different models, right? Um, and also really interested in putting on the table um, the discussion, there's privacy and then there's, you know, the opportunity to participate in the data economy. And as folks know, you know, we've, we've uh, read and you know, are a fan of Jaron Lanier, who's a chief architect at Microsoft. And his team estimated that data is worth about $20,000 per person. You know, I'm curious what we think about, you know, sort of the tug of war between privacy and and so the economic um, opportunity that that raises for folks, you know, particularly thinking about um, the types of data that people are willing to participate and share. Obviously, the stuff that folks are not, I think, is off the table. And we, we recognize we've got to get privacy locked down in a way that really supports um, individual user intent. But sort of stipulating that that bucket of, you know, um, what I'm willing to, you know, have known about me in service of both participating in the data economy and also getting offers that are pertinent to me. Uh, I'd love to hear from others and I want to encourage audience members as well to kind of weigh in as well as our, our panelists. Ethan, I see you might be um, ready to jump in. Yeah, so I think um, the interesting thing is that Lots of people love to talk about data privacy, and, and we like to make a big deal out of this, among many other things. The reality is, is I'm not sure that uh, everyday normal people in their applications and their usage of things cares. Um, I, I think that we want them to care, and I think they care for a very short amount of time when something goes wrong with you know, an e-commerce site that loses 100 million you know, credit card numbers or, or, or something like that. But but I wonder, I, I just look, I just think of different examples where, you know, a little while, so maybe things have changed. But when I went to college, um, I remember a table sitting outside in front of one of the buildings where you know you can sign up for a credit card in exchange for a two liter of Coke and a T-shirt. Um, you know, and people were like, "Hey, I'll, take, I'll, 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 I'll destroy my credit rating for a two liter of Coke and a T-shirt." And that's a simplistic example, but my, my point is, is I think people are very quick to um, sell what has a lot more value than they realize by. In the data, for example, people you know saying, "Oh, you need access to my contacts. That's fine. Uh, who cares? Uh, or you need access to my graph by me allowing my by signing in using Twitter or whatever. Okay, that's fine." And I think people don't realize the extent of what that means. But I also, I'm not sure that they actually care to the extent that it will change behavior. Um, because so if I go back to SNPs, uh, that the AI, the embedded AI for voice recognition and that startup that I mentioned before, one of the examples that the founder of Use when he'd be explaining this to people, but I thought this was very interesting lesson. When he'd tell, when he'd explain to adults, you know, the reality of how voice recognition works and how the um, and how cloud computing behind the scenes was, was being applied to that, and how these um, how this audio was being shared and, and, and not necessarily being well taken care of or, or on the other side. Um, what he what they found was that it, it moved the needle for practically no one, um, that they would be fine putting an Alexa or, or, or whatever in, in their living room or in their kitchen, zero issue, they completely understood that they were being listened to, and they just, in the end of the day, they didn't care because they wanted to be able to uh, play their Spotify or ask for the news or do whatever it is that that device was giving them, and it just didn't matter. However, you ask the same person if they would be willing to put that same device in their child's bedroom, and they would all say no. And it was proving that people understood the problem, they just didn't care because the solution was more interesting. Interesting. Exactly. Actually, we've, we've had some research on this, and uh, this says that about 6% of people uh, would be uh, would be uh, wary of sharing their uh, their data. And if properly educated, probably it would go up to 20%. But uh, our expectation is about 80% if the product is interesting enough, would uh, not mind under any circumstances to, uh, to uh, allow their data to be taken, which in turn suggests the question that 
even if there is a partial uh, data privacy uh, system by design that you can opt in or out, the more likely be the ones that have already uh, means and education that would uh, be uh, navigating it better than the other parts of society. And the last piece I wanted uh, to mention is, which I've had uh, in my discussions, for instance, with Google, is that they say uh, that if we limit uh, the Western companies' access to quality data or make it more difficult, that will increase the competitiveness of their uh, of the Chinese companies, where obviously there will be no privacy by design until um, the the system there is as it is, and they claim that that will give them the technological technological advantage on a number of key technologies like AI and others. I think you know. So just um, that's exactly in line with, with, with where I was wanting to go with that, and I think that completes it perfectly. My, my only, I guess the close out what I was wanting to say there is, is the solution has to be more interesting than, than the problem. And so right now I'm getting something of value, which is um, access to Clubhouse or Facebook or whatever those things might happen to be. And so people don't care. I think the monetization of our data, I don't think the control access matters because people just aren't going to care enough to, to use the tools or to care about it unless the companies behind are forced. But now if we create a scenario where our data could be monetized, now we're going to care about the tools because the tools need to exist for me to monetize my data. And I have created a new solution, which is, uh, well, now I actually do care about having a, an Alexa or, or a Siri or, or Google uh, uh, home in my house simply because um, I'm able to monetize through the usage of that scenario. So now privacy is not so much about me giving a crap about privacy and who has access to my data. It's about me monetizing that scenario. And I think we just need a stronger, um, a stronger bait, you know, in that scenario. Of, you know, there needs to be something more there because I don't think people care. Yeah, I, as I said, my big concern about consumer driven privacy is I don't think consumers care, and it's not clear to me that they will. But I do think monetization will drive the behavior that most of the people on the panel want, which is to enable people to have different privacy. But I wanted to circle back to Elizabeth's, uh, one aspect of Elizabeth's question about sort of the social context and, you know, the difference in classes that we see. And one of the things to keep in mind is privacy has always been something that has been enjoyed by the elite. Um, you know, Europe, Europe has a sort of right to reputation that, that translates to right to privacy. That right to reputation was based on the right of the nobles to protect their identity. It wasn't, you know, privacy wasn't for serfs. Um, and it's not clear as our economy becomes more digital, it is not clear to me that people on the lower end of the economic scale would be able to afford privacy. Um, I need to find a job. I want as many people to know about my qualifications as possible. Am I really going to trade? chance for a career, for privacy, it seems unlikely. Yeah, well, I, I think that is that is the crux of the issue, and I, I wrote a white paper a number of years ago called The Economics of Privacy, and it's precisely your point. Um, there are people today who pay a lot of money to have access to services um, without threats to their privacy, and uh, it's very convoluted, it's very difficult, it makes it very difficult to be part of the public square. But I think what Apple is trying to do systematically um, is laudable in that they're shifting the default mode to um, you may not have my data unless I allow you to have it. And if there are financial consequences to that or service consequences to that, at least the person makes an explicit decision about what they're willing to pay for the privacy in that context. There is a huge urban legend that millennials don't and, and post-millennials don't care about privacy. It, the Center for Democracy and Technology studied that years ago and published a report debunking that myth. The only reason millennials don't care is because they're profoundly ignorant of, of what the options are, but when you explicitly say, if this, then that, what would you do? 
their privacy preferences very much resemble almost every other generation. And so um, this mythology is based on the assumption that uh, 20-somethings and 30-somethings really don't care. But they do care. They're just not paying attention. John, thank you for that. And actually, since we have a millennial on our panel, Julie is the host. Julie, can I take, yes, please weigh in. Sure. I, um, I actually really appreciate you saying that, John, because I am, well, I'm a like cusp end millennial. I think that for many people, it's, it's really not a matter of not caring um, about privacy or caring that your da data is going to be used for something. It's that I don't really understand. I don't really think that a lot of people understand um, or know what giving up their data actually means in the long term or big picture. And they're kind of saying, sure, you can have my data in this like immediate impulsive sort of way. So it's not, there's a, there's a little bit of a disconnect there in understanding kind of big picture. Thanks so much, Julie. And I'm wondering if, you know, this is out to the audience too, raise your hand if you'd like to jump on the stage. Um, I'm curious whether to the point that was articulated before, you know, if your data is in fact worth $20,000 a year, uh, do you care a whole lot more about privacy and, you know, is that material or interesting? Um, so curious if we if folks want to raise their hand and jump on stage and provide a perspective meanwhile I see that we just got one of our other um, friends here Michael I want to give you an opportunity to jump on the stage if you'd like thanks Elizabeth um, I uh, apologize for joining uh, late because it sounds like a really intriguing uh, discussion that's been going on I will just simply add something it's a little bit of a perspective here because we use we throw around uh, the terms millennial and Gen Z and, uh, you know, certainly um, uh, other generational terms quite, quite uh, uh, you know, passively almost as if everybody understands that. But they just give a little uh, perspective on this. Um, when we say millennials, we got to recognize that the oldest millennials are now 40 years old. And I think that um, one of the things that, uh, you know, was being brought up here, I think, Terrence, you, you mentioned this, um, was uh, related to, and, and John, I think you were talking about uh, the fallacy of not caring. The fact of the matter is that the uh, millennial generation has now come into many other things, including home ownership, they've come into families, they've come into... Um, you know, really grinding it out in the workforce uh, through um, certain recessionary things that we've had to go through. And therefore, um, it may not be so much a mindset as much as it's a reality of living. The fact that your data, your personal data, your medical data, et cetera, um, you know, now has um, implications to what it is that you are doing in your real life. And so, you know, as you start to look back at Gen Z, which is technically, you know, people under the age of 20, 24, um, you know, they're, they haven't necessarily quite gotten there, but they're going to be affected in much the same way. So to Julie's point that um, it, it's really, uh, you know, it's not a, not a, a genetic kind of thing, uh, but that the generational thing is, is more relative to um, what uh, what is the ecosystem that you're working in, and therefore, what what does that data, what does it you know have as value to you, and what do you feel like you need to protect? Hopefully Thanks so that, much. That makes some sense. Uh, this yeah, no, it's, it's it's a good reminder. Thank you for you know recasting sort of the generational buckets. Really helpful, Julie. I think we have um, somebody who wants to say something. Yeah, Tara, I'd like to invite you to go ahead and speak. Yeah, thank you so much for having this discussion. Um, uh, I just wanted to chime in when you uh, mentioned the millennials and what goes into there and uh, will they be able to, or they, would they be wanting to uh, give up on their privacy? It was what, $20,000. So um, we also, I'm actually uh, starting in you know, one of the lectures that we had was actually talking about uh, privacy issues in tech. and. Uh, when I have these conversations with people around, I think uh, a large part of it is 
uh, a misconception to um, misconception understanding how um, how it is going to affect them and um, I think the way they perceive it is that oh it is going to be for our benefit because um, they are going to um, the, uh, these tech companies are going to use our data to make it more efficient for us to utilize resources make life convenient but uh, I used to go through this book called uh, The Age of Surveillance and the kind of things that, that are mentioned there and how um, our data would be used as a commodity um, in an uh, exchange market where actually the stocks, they will not be stocks but they will be uh, data that will be uh, traded and things like that and that's uh, scary I think. Uh, so uh, that's one that a lot of people cannot perceive what could be the, the and repercussions and second is that I think uh, these social media platforms or tech has become such an integral part of life that it is very difficult to survive that in the society um, without it and um, I think the notion is that in no matter what you cannot uh, you cannot prevent these uh, companies to get source data uh, because there are public platforms there are so many ways in which they can get the information so there's no point in any way uh, hiding yourself or uh, doing the minimal at least steps like you know um, not sharing your location uh, on the application things like that so yeah that's that's mm -hmm. just thinking out loud honestly I, I yeah. just found this topic interesting so no, we really appreciate it, and I think you raised some really good points, including, you know, the last point uh, among many, this sort of the sense of, you know, it's pointless, you can't opt out enough times, you know, how many times you have to do the same thing uh, as an individual, it's, you know, it's another chore, right, that doesn't necessarily feel doable, and, and I think you're raising the issue of the, the distinction between the individual navigating against a system versus a collective navigating, you know, the system. So I don't know if I'm, am I breaking up guys or can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you. Okay, I got a notice that said that I was breaking up. So <laughs> um, new, new to that. Um, okay, so Julie, I think that we maybe have some other guests that want to say something. Yeah, uh, Jessica. Hello everyone. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Yeah, I just wanted to echo that. I think a lot, as I'm a millennial, and I do you know a lot of Gen Zers, talk to them, and I do think that a lot of people do care, but it really is, comes down to the lack of option. A lot of young people also are opting out of social media specifically, so I don't think that it's this lack of care. I think it's like more of a lack of option and the overwhelm, so I just wanted to echo and add to that. Thank you. Mm, thank you so much. Um, I want to turn our attention, if we can, for a moment. Uh, and folks, if you want to raise your hand, please continue to do so. We'll call on as many as we can. Um, I want to raise the question on um, privacy as it relates to our biological data. And I'm somewhat leveraging the fact that we have a wonderful, esteemed colleague here on the panel as well, John, Dr. John Madison. And you know, the topic is DNA. I don't know if folks caught the 60 Minutes episode a few weeks ago, uh, really sort of expositing the um, lack of privacy, particularly as it relates to the, to the uh, theme of DNA. John, may I ask you to opine? Sure, and, and I, I already took it down, but earlier I posted the two book chapters I've written on exactly that topic. Um, and uh, the issue is that uh, your DNA is uniquely yours, um, unless you have an identical twin. Uh, and even then, uh, it's not 100% identical. And even then, uh, when it's read on different machines at different times, on different specimens, or even on the same specimen, you get different faults based upon how the DNA is unfolded and read and take deep read or shallow read. Uh, um, and so they're, they're, for the most part, it's fair to say that you're the only person on the planet with your DNA. So if you store your DNA, um, so this, this, this is the conundrum 
for all uh, privacy uh, solutions. If anywhere your identity is attached to your DNA, that system is likely to be hackable. And if you can hack it, you can reverse identity. You can re-identify who you are from your DNA. So some of the mechanisms that have been proposed for managing uh, you know, privacy in that context is what's called data perturbation. And I talk about all this in those book chapters. Um, but data perturbation is where you randomly modify uh, inconsequential uh, elements of data. So if, if you, your base sequence is, is TTGA, TG, uh, you could substitute um, a single letter. And if it's in junk DNA, quote, junk DNA, um, it may take someone off the course of re-identifying you, but we only barely have scratched the surface of understanding DNA. So the notion that was uh, promoted uh, shortly after the sequencing of the first human genome that that most of our, our uh, genome is junk uh, was patently observed at, at the outset. Uh, because why would we spend the energy to replicate every single one of those base pairs, 3.2 billion base pairs, every time the cell divides? So um, the point is that if you're really going to use the DNA for research purposes, you, you can't de-identify it. If you, it, the only way to de-identify it is to permanently break its link to you. But if anywhere else in the universe, like 23andMe, you've submitted your DNA and Chinese have bought access to those data um, then, or any of the pharmaceutical companies, they can do the match. They can figure out who you are. Re-identification is child's play in the era of genomics. And I've had this discussion with all the database and, and privacy leads at Google. And privately, frankly, they all 100% agree with that uh, yeah. assertion. Um, it's not publicly what people often agree to, but privately, anybody in, in yeah. engineering and data management understands right. that that's true. Well, and I think the, it, they, I think the current mask du jour is, oh, it's de-identified, right? As if, you know, that is the, elec the magic elixir that solves all. So, no, I appreciate that, John, and, and helpful, and really just sort of exposing the ideas. And, you know, um, Terrence, I'd love to come back to you and, you know, sort of as we think through the future and kind of get, I think on some level we've, we've exposited all these, you know, scary, important, you know, aspects. And, you know, I want to leave in a productive way, which is, you know, what are, what things we need to do, you know, sort of any, any sequence, you know, including policy, technology, you know, what do we need to overcome here? Uh, and what's the future vision, you know, sort of on an optimistic, you know, what we want. If we're creating the world that we want, right, which we all are, uh, what, are what do we want? Well, I think, um, one, my, if you care about privacy, you should be supporting Apple because Apple is the only large organization that I think is really interested in individual privacy in the tech sector. So. I, that is, I, please allow me to amplify that. Apple is the only one who gives an F about privacy, and they're building their brand on it, and we should support them. If we Absolutely. don't support that economically in every possible way, already Mark Zuckerberg has challenged him on this issue, saying, oh, you just want all the data for yourself, and you're trying to, you know, uh, squirrel away your revenue at our expense. Well, look in the mirror, Mr. Mark. <laughs> yeah. Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. I, I think the other thing we need to do, the other thing that needs to happen is at a policy level, we need to put real teeth into privacy regulation. Um, California has actually done a reasonable job of putting real teeth into privacy. And you're starting to see new startups change their behavior because of it. But we need a national, with real teeth, law to make tech obey. Period. Um, the other thing I think is we, we need to decade policymakers. One of the scariest things is that policymakers don't understand how data can be manipulated, how it can be weaponized, how it's collected, and 
there needs to be an education process because one of the real issues, one of the reasons we have all the privacy issues we do is that the people who make our laws aren't technologists and they don't understand many of the issues. And without further education, I don't see how that changes. That's, I think, an, an, an excellent point. And I might add a footnote, which is let's educate their staffers who actually, you know. Do the work. Do the work and write the laws. I mean, it's both, right? It's the staffers that, and they tend to stay and have that sort of continuity. I think that's a, a great suggestion. Um, other suggestions, John, if you're sort of looking forward, uh, what do we need to do be, besides supporting Apple and all of that, which we stipulate? <laughs> You know, I, I, I think the most important thing is to um, uh, support any uh, solution sets, whether it's Kansuli or whether it's citizens spelled with the first I is double I, yeah. whether it's um, Luna DNA, whether it's uh, Nebula Genomics, uh, whether it's Indays, I D A I S, um, which um, is sort of by a friend of mine that is is targeted at the same solution. Always, there there are different use cases that people are building, including Consulu. Um, but we need to draw attention to each of these and let the free market of choice allow people to choose which data they want to protect in what way, um, using which stack. But the the founders of all these companies are truly dedicated. Um, to solving this problem. In the meantime, you know, Apple is the clear big play, but there are lots of other opportunities out there to address this. And, and we need to educate people about just what's happening. And when someone says, do I care if my contact list is monetized? The answer for me is, hell yes. I could lose some friends who would be very upset um, if they knew that their cell phone numbers were, were being sold. Uh, because they have gone through all kinds of contortions to protect their privacy. Some of them have six different cell phone numbers yeah. that they use for different <laughs> privacy levels. So this is the economics of privacy. As, yeah. as uh, Terrence said earlier, we're never going to have a solution that everybody is willing to pay for their privacy. There is an economics to privacy. But we need to provide options for those of us who have the resources and are willing to pay for it. Um, and, and it's totally possible. We're just not there yet. Got it. Anything to say on the policy side, specifically wondering what you think, you know, sort of thinking about our new federal regulators and, you know, thinking about your history in healthcare, John, um, what what policy changes sure. do you perceive? Yeah, yeah HIPAA, HIPAA was written by uh, brilliant people who were uh, Sharon Carey, one of the people who's um, working with uh, Luna DNA. Can you, can you just say what HIPAA is? Because we got a lot of non okay. healthcare techs here. Uh, health, sure. Uh, healthcare Information Portability Ability Act. Um, it is it is the legal route under which all privacy is managed in healthcare. And as to why it falls far short. Uh, because it doesn't even cover, for example, long-term care disability uh, protection for those kinds of issues. And the reason for that is that the lobbies in Washington were so powerful, they do if they tried to incorporate protections for the use cases, the whole thing would have fallen apart and it barely passed through. But there's a section of HIPAA which allows for the free use of de-identified health care data if you remove specified identifiers like name, yep. uh, birth date, zip code, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's like absurdly outdated. Yeah, super outdated. The, yeah. the, authors, the authors knew that at the time, yeah. but, but they did the best they could in the yep. political environment. So what we need to answer your question, Elizabeth, is we need to have um, a rewrite of that in the, in the modern context. And GDPR, while it's poorly written, and it's really poorly written, and while, while it's far from perfect, is it sets some, some objectives, some policy objectives. And so my view is I've done a lot of markup of legislative, been on a number of BACAs, which are the, the hearings that they have in D.C. for, for uh, markup of, of uh, legislation yeah. uh, and so forth. Um, what, what we need to 
careful of is that we clearly identify the objectives but don't specify technologies. Government has a massive history of screwing up when they specify explicit solutions. So it needs to be much more based upon yeah. the desired outcomes, principles, and values associated with it. Got it. Yeah, thanks for that. I appreciate it. Um, want to give, I, I think we've got a couple more um, questions. So, Julie, back to you to intro. Yeah, hi. Remy, if you'd like to take yourself off mute. Welcome. Hi, yeah, I, I didn't have too much to say because I actually got back up from a run, so I'm panting here, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I just want to know what you thought about on the private side more, you know, when you work for a company, I mean, I work for a big company, I, I kind of feel uh, scared about my privacy uh, towards my, my company. And should there be laws on, on, on that front? Mm, protection yeah, laws that protect yeah. you from your, your uh, employer. <laughs> this is a big topic, um, for sure. Well, let's ask you, what do you think the laws ought to be, Remy? I mean, obviously you have concerns and, and, um, and probably rightfully so, right? I mean, I know, for example, you know, many employers, you know, have historically had policies, you know, that are, designed to ensure that they own everything, including all correspondence and you know, pri privacy is out the window on any, on any, on any uh, employer platform. I'm curious what you think the, the um, ideal state would be, Remy. Uh, so, you know, I'm in Europe, I'm actually in France, and we have laws in place that prevent the employer from, uh, you know, using your data to you know, fire you or to, I don't know, like whatever they can do. I don't even know. Know what they can do with my data. Um, I, I I don't know. I I don't trust 100. <laughs> percent I I know that uh, they don't look into me on uh, into my data on purpose. Now, if they had suspicion, I don't know what uh, you know what would be possible. Uh, I just my private life and my and my uh, work life are completely you know there's a brick wall between both of them. Mm -hmm. I encourage everybody to do so because with the complexity of the data, I mean. There's no way to prove that you know your company hasn't used used your data to you know take an advantage over you or you know uh, I don't know. Let's say you're looking for a job uh, elsewhere. They can put in a bad word for you. They can uh, you know uh, put pressure on you and stuff like that. So yeah, it's uh, the, the only thing I would say is don't don't trust don't trust um, <laughs> just just uh, keep a brick wall between your work life and your, and your private life. Thanks for that, Remy. Uh, Terrence, do you want to say anything on this topic? It's thorny. Yeah, I, well, it's absolutely thorny. And I think practically, at least in the US, it's impossible um, for professional level jobs. Uh, I know very few people who would hire somebody that didn't have a LinkedIn profile, for example. Um, even we routinely check. Uh, social media to find out if a person has has shown bad judgment on social media, and so our, our, our as our lives become increasingly digital, um, our work life and our personal lives intertwine, and without specific legislation to prevent that, I I think that's just the way it's going to be. There's too much valuable information that is freely available uh, for employers not to take it. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say, uh, when, when they work from home, uh, you know, not being, uh, just accenting the, uh, the the amount of data that you know we share from from work and from home. There's like no even uh, time and location difference between your actions. So let's say I take a personal action at home at 6 p.m. Is that on work time at work? You know, like there's no there's no uh, differentiator. So it's even harder. Yeah, and one of the things that I've seen is I've seen solutions uh, for contractors that will literally monitor everything they do um, while they work from home. Videotape, audio, constant surveillance. Um, forgot the name of the company, and clearly that that is, in my view, too far. But I do think there's going to be a tendency for companies to try and do this absent legislation. And I, I, this is John, I, I, I think the EU is much more sensible about this kind of thing. I'm not optimistic in the 
U.S. that we're going to make major progress on this uh, until there's, uh, you know, the, the, the many more fouls and harms suffered by the general public that, that are in the zeitgeist that people will recognize the need to address this issue. In the meantime, if you have a corporate phone, laptop, iPad, anything, you should expect that somebody's watching your every move, and if you don't, you will pay a price for it. If there's anything that you do on your personal time that's reflected on your corporate device, they will know about it, and you will be punished, and you may not ever know what hit you. Yeah, that, this is a... This Completely is a, agree. This is definitely, unfortunately, the current state of play in the United States. It's it's pretty draconian, but I think it's here with us for a while. And given the other plethora of things we have to encounter and overcome here in the United States, this un unfortunately probably gets further down the list. That said, I want we're at the time where I want to say deep thanks to our panelists and the audience. Uh, Really great, thoughtful engagement. Um, gratitude, deep gratitude to Julie for helping pull this dialogue together. This is the inaugural discussion. You know, soon this will become a club. Um, Julie, I'm going to pass it back to you for just our final announcements. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, uh, for a very interesting and engaging conversation um, on this topic that could just go on forever. Um, I Just in closing, I'm Julie Schmid, and I'm project manager at Consuli. Um, we're hosting this room, soon to be club. Um, so just some things to note. Please follow me and Elizabeth and our other moderators, Terrence, um, Michael, John. Um, and you can see uh, on, on my profile, as well as Elizabeth's and Michael's, are uh, Consuli's various rooms that we're hosting. Um, we've got this one that will be weekly, as well as uh, Friday, one on clinical trials, uh, and one discussing long COVID with patients and researchers on Wednesdays. Um, all that detail is in my bio, as well as a way to contact um, us directly. So my email is there. Uh, you can find us on LinkedIn. We definitely encourage uh, you to reach out and contact us um, for any questions, comments, feedback. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, be sure to follow other people in the room if you found any of that interesting. Um, and I hope you join us next week. Uh, again, for all of those that don't know what Consuli is, broadly, Consuli is a public benefit company with a mission to enable individuals to participate in the data economy. As we discussed, experts do suggest our individual data is worth about $20,000 per year, so this is pretty important. Um, we are doing this by operating a marketplace for members where we become their agent and assemble patients' health records, labs, prescriptions, wearables, quality of life surveys, all those sorts of things. Um, and members receive smart matched individualized offers from us for opportunities, including um, the ability to participate in clinical trials, data trials, things of that nature. Um, and if any members want to participate in long COVID or any clinical trials, you can sign up to be matched to a study at consuli.net. That's C-O-N-S-U-L-I dot net. There's no cost to join our movement for data dignity. Um, and you can learn more about us on our websites as well as uh, Panelists, Terrence and social John. media. Well, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. A lot of fun. Have Bye -bye. a good day, everybody. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you very much. Goodbye.